Once upon a time, 1983 to be exact, I was asked to host a meal and a talk at my college in Annapolis, Maryland, for a group that was walking around the world out of concern at the nuclear arms race. I decided I would leave with them at the naval base the next day, then it seemed considerate to walk them to the bridge across the Chesapeake Bay. I'd never walked across the bridge. This might be my one chance, so I kept walking. That evening, I could catch a ride back to my college or with just my scuffy loafers and the clothes I stood up in, I could keep walking. And that's how I ended up in Moscow 10 months later. How did I get there? Well, through Camden, New Jersey, as well as Greenock and Gurick, Paisley and Kilmarnock, but also by walking through some fears. I had never been chosen first for teams and was afraid I wasn't up to it, would be left behind, couldn't keep up the pace. Most laughably, when I started, I was afraid walking would be boring. I was afraid walking would be more boring than I could endure. But over that bridge, we'd left behind the urban sprawl of the Eastern seaboard. In the quiet of that strand of forgotten Maryland that buffered those cities from the great Atlantic, the Eastern shore as it's known, harvest was golden, butterflies lazy and the wind gentle. Those first few days, I became reacquainted with my own heartbeat, that it set the pace of my walking, that the verges in their abundance fill my senses with life's persistent, varied capacity for finding a way. This would become the larger pattern of the walk, times immersed, healed within the slow roll of the land, punctuated by the grit of walking into traffic through waste and warehouse land, into cities, into the hubbub of rallies, radio interviews, heading marches with banners, standing on the steps of great buildings for photo ops, and then back out again to take up the deeper, better, saner conversation with the land. Let me take you with me through a cold, damp Scotland in March, where my blisters got blisters, through the chilly, newly lambed hills of Cumbria, and all the way through the Yorkshires, where so many good folk shared plum and pickle sandwiches, many different varieties of flapjack, and strong steaming hot tea as they braved the squalls on those high long hills with us. Come with me to the civic reception in Sheffield, where we were presented with the most delicately knitted baby bonnets with satin ribbon threaded through them to give to those in their twin city in the Soviet Union. I put them in my backpack. Its contents were pared down to the bare minimum you may be able to appreciate, but those bonnets had pride of place. On they went with us down to Brighton, across France to Strasbourg, and the dark, tall, very well signposted forests of Southern Germany. I wish I had time to tell you about all the people we met. Mornings would start with a circle and a song we learned in Scotland. Farewell, my friends, we're bound for Canaan. We're traveling through the wilderness. Many of the people in that circle would walk with us, wanted to walk us out of their town. Often by lunch, people in the town we were going to would come out and walk with us towards our destination, destination that evening. And sometimes in the middle of nowhere, a car would pull up and out would get someone hauling with them a backpack who we least expected. Someone who'd walked with us a week before and who we'd worried would even make it through that day. But here they were facing down their fears and walking beyond them. It was a divided Germany that we went to and the way becomes complicated there. 
As you might be able to imagine, Eastern Bloc governments were wary of us and negotiations with them, let's say, protracted. We had a foray into East Germany and were spat out again. We walked north and into the long evenings of Finnish hospitality, saunas with a run and a jump off a dock into the sunset over the Baltic. And quite a few different varieties of homemade apple wine, as I recall. But always, day by day, its border with the Soviet Union was drawing ever nearer. You may be surprised to learn that if you walked up to it with peace banners waving and leaflets in your extended hand, politely requesting to be let in, the officer on duty would be obliged to tell you he was not authorized to let you in. So it was back to Helsinki and the Soviet embassy there. Through the hot August days between Hiroshima and Nagasaki day, we fasted and negotiated. Out came the beautiful baby bonnets. As they lay in my hands, I locked eyes with the Soviet official. It was a strained look. Yes, they wanted the PR opportunity such a gift would give them. No, they did not trust us. In that look, beyond the tactical smiles, there seemed to be layers of contradictions, cynicism, double bluff, a sense of farce, and things I couldn't even fathom. A chess game of sorts played out as those bonnets lay in my lap. Were we really so naive as to think the nuclear arms race could be solved by knitwear? Perhaps not, but were we naive enough to be dangerous? A few evenings later, I was sweeping up at the Women's Union for Peace and Freedom where we had been staying. Members of the wall had already started leaving. We were slowly disbanding and the phone rang. It was the embassy. Could I be at the door in 20 minutes ready to go? A large black car drew up and sped us through the gates of the embassy into the waiting room where we listened as we could hear the heavy thump of stamps coming down on our passports. Back in the black car and eking through rush hour traffic, we made it to the station with just enough time to run for it. We caught the night train to Moscow. And that was how I came to be in the offices of the headquarters of the Soviet Peace Committee, being lectured in Russian by General Yuri Zukov, its president. He was scolding us, telling us only mass demonstrations, the united might of the people would bring change. We must go back and organize these demonstrations in the West. It might have gone differently, but see, the man whose vision the walk had been was a man of strict principle. When others on the walk had taken lifts the last few miles to get to an evening meeting, Sieb had walked every last step, even if it meant going back in the dark to do it after the meeting. When we'd arrived in Moscow into the jostling crowd of the station and come through to its main lobby, Sieb announced we were walking to the committee meeting. Somehow, he had a map to it. We were near a side exit and out we went. If it was the only walking he was ever going to do in the Soviet Union, he was going to that meeting on foot. When we turned up 20 minutes later, we were greeted by ashen, astonished faces. Why had we not come out to the front of the station? They had a distinguished escort waiting for us. The meeting was over before it began. Maybe just as well. We had been true to ourselves, me with my baby bonnets, Sieb with his principled, rugged individual determination to walk. And that concluded the official cultural exchange of our trip. But for me, the real cultural exchange was just starting. We had rooms in a hotel just off Red Square and a day before our return train journey. I wasn't spending it in the hotel. I was out again and drifting through the crowds. I queued up for ice cream, sat in the park, even found an art museum. 
As well as the bonnets, I had ribbons on my backpack. As I'd walked, anyone who wanted could write their name and address on them. And I'd promised them to give them to those I met on the other side of the Iron Curtain. By the time I reached Moscow, I had quite a rainbow on my back. With gestures in very bad Russian, I struck up conversations here and there, got out my scissors, and bit by bit, the rainbow dispersed through the streets of Moscow. Until this one moment, when I wandered into a store and found a stall selling baby clothes. With gestures, I pointed to a little jacket that I wanted. The woman serving me looked every bit the babushka, the grandmother of Russian fairy tales. I took out my baby bonnets and tried to make her understand they were a gift for her. By this time, quite a crowd had gathered round us. She handed me the jacket wrapped in brown paper and after much discussion with those assembled, said a phrase in heavily accented English, is gift, and she smiled broadly. By the time I left the store, my rainbow had been shorn quite short. It's been many years since I thought about that moment our hands touched. The importance for me of what was exchanged, how easily the iron of that curtain crumbled. Someone I met on that walk sent me some of the rubble of the actual Berlin Wall when it fell. Folk don't write letters much anymore, but last I heard, when that wall fell, folk connected by those bits of ribbon were still writing to each other. And perhaps they still are.